Here we go with some DM tips for Chapter 4 of Wild Beyond the Witch Light. This is the Realm of Yawn and the Citadel of Motherhorn. And there will be spoilers abounding here, so if you are a player, please come back after playing the adventure. Let us know how it went. If you're a DM, this is for level 6 characters. The page references that are in the description below will be to the hardcover version of the adventure. So the adventure is about 8 to 12 hours to get through Yawn and Motherhorn. I did it in two four-hour sessions, and here's the pacing I used for that. For the first session, it's all about Yawn and the travels through the realm of Yawn. Here's a map of Yawn. Here, thou, as with the other Fey realms, the realm can move around, and so the players can kind of encounter the things in the order you want them to encounter them, even if they think they're going somewhere else. You can also use the Tornado Random Encounter to redirect their travels. So I did, for the first hour, the party's arrival, they're meeting with Amador and Gleam, and some of the random encounters. And then at the top of hour one, Lockbury Henge, and then the top of the hour two, the Fey Beacons, and the top of hour three, the Brigannock Mine, and they ended with a long rest at the mine. And they should already be leveled. They don't level from six to seven for the next part, but in case they were level five, they could level up to six there. You can use, of course, the random encounters to space out the hours. Um, I was able to get all of the random encounters in, and they are all pretty cool. Then, for the second session, into Motherhorn. First hour would be approaching or coming through the secret tunnel, and maybe getting some exploration in. By the top of the first hour to the second hour, they should have arrived at the amphitheater and be pulled into doing a play. They will be taken away where they can prepare to do the play, and when they're there, they could um, leave the area, do have some exploration, and get back in time for the play, or just not come back for the play. Either way, their choice. Hour two to three will be performing the play, and more exploration potentially. And then hour three to four, the final showdown with Edelin. After the play is performed, if they do well, the party will be taken to an audience. The party I ran for, they split from the person taking them. They, like, you know, overpowered them, imprisoned them. In fact, it was stage fright, and they took his scepter, which you'll see is important. And then they confronted Edelin in the viewing gallery, which is, I think, the coolest place for the party to encounter her. And then you got the exploration at the end to wrap up the session. So that's the pacing. You'll see that down below in the description as well. I also have some macros for the overall Prismere macros that you can copy. Things like the rules, the uh, what happens to children, and strong emotions in Prismere, etc. Now for music. This is a pretty atmospheric adventure. I used... Dark and Stormy by Tabletop Audio is a good choice. And you can slide the volume up and down depending on if the party is out in the elements or if they're, you know, in the castle or below the earth at some point. In place of Dark and Stormy, you could also use Light or Medium Rain plus Thunder Crashes and manually control the, the thunder that's going on. And then once they enter either the... Uh, the Chasm or Motherhorn, you can take Existential Dread and start piping that in at some level as well. Now for the Story Tracker, things to check on before the party starts adventuring or as they're adventuring. And this is all down below as well. Was anyone crowned the Witchlight Monarch? Have they found the Unicorn Horn yet? Did they receive acting lessons from Kendalfoot? Did they make a wish with Northwind? Are they missing the items they suspect Edelin Moongrave has? Did they capture or destroy a balloon made out of clouds when they were in uh, downfall? Did they learn the Korea jig in the first part of this adventure, the first part of this chapter? Did they skillfully ride a giant dragonfly in the Witchlight Carnival? And lastly, are they here on a chore from Scabatha? And that would be to, you know, mess up a play. Then I like to feed knowledge to the players so they can share that organically in character during the session. I got about a dozen items that are in the description below. Um, some information about the throne they could know, that's in one of the random encounters. Some information about the gaming set, that's in Lockbury Henge. Uh, some information about Gleam and Burley and Hurley and Glister, uh, about the League of Malevents, about Valor's Call, and Briganox, Darklings, and Coret as well. Okay, so locations. The first thing described are the lightning rods. And my party never went up after the lightning rods, so I didn't get that 
The next thing encountered is the arrival. And then you have the random encounters. Astronomer's throne, goats, cyclops. The throne is fantastic. It's such a cool atmospheric piece. You definitely want to get that in. The cyclops, if the party um, defeats the cyclops or sends them off in a wild good ch goose chase, don't forget Amador knows where the cyclops lives, so the party could go raid his dwelling for treasure. Then you have um, the goblin shadows and the pageant wagon. So I had the goblin shadows show up before the pageant wagon and then follow the party. The party didn't confront them, came across the pageant wagon. The pageant wagon then is doing a play, showing the shadows, shadow marionettes attacking the party at the same time that the actual shadows attack the party. And now just two shadows is not much of a challenge, so you might bump that up to three or four. Okay, then you got Lockbury Hedge, the Fay Beacons, the Brigandock Mine. Oh, the Tornado. So I use the Tornado to split the party apart from its um, menagerie of, of followers. Um, I know some players might like having, you know, you have Amador, Polly, Glister, Gleam. You got the Tin Can and Clapperclaw. So you got like, you know, six other characters following the party around. And that got a little much. So I split the party, split them apart there to be reunited later with the tornado. Okay, so then the party gets into, oh, let's look at the uh, the maps. These maps are just fantastic. I have links down below. These ones come from the Wild Beyond the Witchlight map pack. And you can see they're just really nice atmospheric. This, this encounter is tremendously fun. Really hype up for Riven Wish Chasm the uh, the you know need not to dally on the bridge. Hopefully the party will catch the glimpse and as soon as someone crosses midpoint, make sure to have the skull congratulate them. So hopefully the party can catch on. Three flame skulls might be a little much for a lot of parties. Three fireballs, you know, boom, boom, boom. It's gonna take out whoever was last in initiative, not even give them a chance to act. So either stagger the arrival of the skulls or maybe consider only doing two of the skulls. Up to you. Okay. So that's, uh, there's Lockbury Hedge, there's the Bay Beacons, just wonderful, wonderful maps. Now, coming to Motherhorn. So here's an outside view of Motherhorn. And I would show that to the players. Uh, this, this, this balcony here is off by level, it should be up in the mid-levels there. Otherwise, great, great little map there. Um, so the party can come in below or they can come in above. Now, when they get to the amphitheater and they're preparing for the play, they can be left alone for some time, so they can definitely explore some there. When they're performing the play, emphasize that Andalyn wants to see an unhappy ending. And I would do maybe the lines a little differently than I did the first time. So here are all the lines. And what I did is I just put this where the players could see them, had every player roll a d6, and put their token by the line that their number rolled. And then just every time they finished the line, had them roll another d6 and move them down that far. I might that up to, up that to a D10 because D6 wasn't getting very far through the list before people started to die. So maybe a D10 might be the sweet spot. Um, up to you how you want to do that. Okay. Uh, one thing to watch out for in the pit hallway here, even the player version, there's the outline of the pit. So watch out for that. Uh, the shadow theater. Use caution in this that shadow theater. That many shadows at once can be uh, a TPK real fast. But of course... The party just goes to sleep if they're TPK'd, so that might be that might be okay. Then you have the stage workshop down below. So make sure in the stage workshop, be generous um, or don't be ungenerous. Letting the party sneak their way through here the first time, they will be able to come back with Charmé later. So don't go with, you know, everyone's got to make a still check. And if one out of six people fail it, they're out of luck. Maybe do group checks and something like that. That's what I'd recommend. The Orrery of Tragedies. So if the party gets to here, hopefully they've been paying attention to how powered, how things are powered up. And also if they're down here and they look up, they may see one of the sisters looking out over the Orrery. Although they probably won't see Edelin because she'll be like right up above them. Okay, then coming up to the viewing gallery. So this is a really cool setting. <clears throat> I'd recommend upping Edelin's hit points a little bit. Just to give her a little bit more time to live, uh, make the encounter last a little bit longer. She's very dangerous with her attacks if the Ori is running, because she can throw people into it. It does tremendous damage. Level 6 character is usually not going to hit the floor alive. And that can be kind of a downer for the players. But if the player's been smart 
and destroy the Sori before they encounter her, much less dangerous that way. So then don't hesitate to upper hit points for that. I had still Bavlorna alive, and Bavlorna or Scabatha could be here. Bavlorna ran for it, jumped on the Ornithopter rather than her lily pad. She had grabbed her lily pad and jumped on the Ornithopter and ran for it. That doesn't require attunement, so any of the hags can take the Ornithopter to get away. And that brought the end of the adventure. This is just really cool um, adventure. I hope you have a good time with it. Leave, uh, leave a, or a comment below and let us know how it went. Good luck.